Hi. There, that one works. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Glass Room. This is our events program. It takes place here daily. Um, we have different events every day that give us a chance to delve deeper into some of the issues that are raised in the exhibits that you see here. And it also gives you a chance to join the conversation and ask questions. And um, here's where we bring in the experts to talk about the really deep stuff. Um, to do a deep dive into surveillance today, we have Sarus Farvar, who is a technology, investigative tech reporter at NBC News. Um, prior to that, he was a writer at Ars Technica, where I devoured his writing. And since I live in Germany, it made me feel connected to all of the creepy stuff that was going on in the US regarding surveillance. So I'm grateful to him for that, for keeping me apprised. Thank you. Um, his most recent book, Habeas Data, which I also devoured, I recommend to anyone who's inter interested in the intersection of surveillance, privacy, personal data, and law enforcement. Um, it goes through 50 years of the history of um, cases that have to do with the use of uh, our personal data and surveillance. Um, he encourages you to send him tips. Yeah. So please do that. Um, we're looking forward to hearing him talk today about uh, three precedent-setting precedent legal cases that have to do with surveillance at United States borders, which is something I think we can all relate to in our current moment. So um, without further ado, I welcome Cyrus. Sarus, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Christy. Um, how are you guys doing tonight? What's going on? Uh, yeah, so I'm Sarus. Um, I don't have slides because I don't like making them and I don't think uh, anyone really is here to see slides. Hopefully you're here to see me. Um, thank you all for coming out. Thank you to Tactical Tech and the folks downstairs, people working tonight. Um, I had never been to this uh, show before today. I had a quick brief tour on the way in. It was very cool. I got to see, if you haven't done this, go run your face through this machine downstairs to see if you're in a Facial recognition database, that's pretty fun. Apparently I'm not, um, so that's surprising. Uh, maybe good, um, but yeah. Um, so check that out. Um, yeah, uh, I'm Sarus Farvar. I work for NBC News. Um, I'm a national reporter, so I don't work for the NBC local affiliate. Uh, you probably won't see me on TV because I mostly write on the internet, um, but if you think I should be more on TV, please tell my bosses. Um, so I write a lot about the intersection of technology, the law, surveillance, privacy, all of those things. Um, a lot of the folks, I think, who are behind this project uh, live in and work in Germany. And Germany is a country that is near and dear to my heart because I lived there for two years uh, about basically a decade ago, not, a little, little, little less than a decade ago. Um, from 2010 to 2012, I was a reporter at Deutsche Welle English, which is kind of like the BBC World Service for Germany. I had, a, I had an English language radio show, half an hour. It was syndicated all over the world. If you listen in Nigeria on shortwave or Indonesia or Australia or whatever, you could, you could listen to it. It's called Spectrum. It's still going. I'm not on it anymore, but you can listen to it if you want to. Uh, it focused on European science and technology news. And when I arrived in Germany in the spring of 2010, there was a very big tech story uh, that everybody was really excited about. I was talking with somebody about this before the show. Uh, this was when Google Street View arrived in Germany. And I don't know if you guys remember when Google Street View arrived in this country, but basically no one cared, right? Like basically, like our friends at the Electronic Frontier Foundation and a few other like activist groups, like, uh, you know, put up a big stink. Uh, but by and large, it's a thing that we live with today, right? You, you can go on Google, Google Maps right now, and you can punch in your address or your friend's address or you know, your frenemy's address, and you can see a picture of their house. And we've just kind of accepted this as a country, right? That a private company has taken pictures of every single street in this country. And not only that, continues to do it every year, right? If you keep looking in Google Street View, you'll notice the picture of your front door changes once, twice, maybe a little bit more uh, per year. In Germany, it was a little bit different because in the spring of 2010, they started sending these little Google cars around Germany. And Germans, as you might know, are super into privacy. Uh, and so they did not like the idea of a foreign company rolling cars down their streets and taking pictures of all their houses. So uh, they made a big stink about this. Uh, this was a big deal in the news. You had a lot of German politicians saying they were gonna really fight this. Uh, and that was when I arrived in, in Germany. And I started to think like, this is weird, like we, like we totally, we, I thought we settled this in the US, but like Germ you know, Germans obviously have a different, different perspective. And so I started kind of interrogating uh, why that was, you know, and started to un try to figure out 
or try to think about why and how different cultures and different communities think about privacy in different kinds of ways. Um, one of the things that I had to do when I arrived in Germany was I had to register myself with the city hall when I arrived. It was like one of the very first things I had to do. Not just because I was a weirdo foreigner, but every German has to do this. Um, you have to show up in person with your identity documents, your passport, your residency card, whatever, and you have to present yourself at the city hall, and you say, hi, I'm here, this is me, uh, here's my address, and they go beep, 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 and then you're, you're good to go, right? So, so you're, you're registered as far as the city is concerned. Uh, if you're German, foreign, doesn't matter. If you move apartments across town or if you move to a different city, you have to do this again. If you leave the country, you have to do it again. And I found this totally weird, right? We all carry driver's licenses. I think we all pay taxes, hopefully. Um, but, right, so like the government knows where we exist, but I think culturally, by and large, as Americans, I think we would be a little bit freaked out if we had to like show up in person at a city hall, at a government office, every time we moved houses. I think, I think most of us would find that a bit disturbing. But in Germany, it was totally fine. They were just like, oh yeah, this is very normal. You just show up, do the thing, it's fine. And I was like, okay, but you guys are freaking out about the street view, but you're cool with the, with the, the, the city hall thing. So I had kind of a weird, trying to, trying to square those two things. Whereas like, in the, in, I, and I sort of came to realize that in Germany, people are, generally speaking, pretty accepting of the government, and generally speaking, less accepting of private companies. And in this country, generally speaking, it's the opposite, right? If you think about like, what the US Constitution is as a document, what the Bill of Rights is, it's a, it's, it's a description, largely, of what the government cannot do, right? Congress shall make no law, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, if you think about the First Amendment, right? Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech, uh, you know, re petition of the government, uh, freedom of religion, all that stuff, freedom of assembly, all that good stuff, right? Second Amendment, we all know very well. Third Amendment, one of my favorite amendments, the most underrated amendment I will submit to you. Um, the Third Amendment, so you guys are all privacy nerds, you're all here tonight. The Third Amendment, I submit to you, is the privacy amendment, right? What is the Third Amendment? Probably, mo does anyone remember what the Third Amendment is? Wow, no privacy nerds? Okay. Go home, read your constitution tonight. The Third Amendment protects us against the government quartering soldiers in our homes. That's weird, right? Like, that's very weird. Uh, why, why would 18th century Americans care about the government quartering soldiers in your homes? Well, have you ever had like a house guest that stayed like too long? <laughs> have you ever had a house guest who had like guns or muskets or, you know, and was stinky and like wouldn't leave your barn or whatever, right? Like that, like, I ima like I'm trying to imagine like what is the rationale for that? And that's probably because like it's freaking annoying to have like a regiment of dudes with muskets like, you know, eating your, you know, uh, I was going to say cattle, but like, well, you know, eating your like stuff, right? Like taking over your, your property and, and stuff like that. So that's like built into our constitution. And one of the reasons why it's in there is not just because it's annoying, but it's also invasive, right? It's like, it's like invas in, invasive of our physical space, of our private space, of our homes, right? And that's one of the things that, that, we, that we care about and that, our, that, our, that, our, uh, that the framers of the Constitution care a lot about. And if you translate that to more contemporary time, the Third Amendment, by the way, go home tonight, go look up, there's an Onion article about the like, Third Amendment Advocacy Society, which does not exist. Um, but like, it, it, it's a joke, it's a joke in the legal community. There's, no, there's almost no case law about the Third Amendment. There's one case in the 1960s that's called Griswold versus Connecticut, which has to do with uh, access to birth control. And the Supreme Court in that case, this was in the 1960s, basically talked about how the Third Amendment uh, uh, translates or transmits a, uh, a penumbra, uh, which is a great word, um, of privacy. And that one of the realms of privacy has to do with like medical privacy. So this is like this tiny, tiny reference in this case that really has nothing to do with you know, soldiers in barns. But I think that that is something that is noteworthy that it's encoded into this document from you know, a couple centuries ago. Um, we also, of course, have the Fourth Amendment, right, which protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures. This is the one that I think many of us are familiar with. Um, it's important to remember that the Fourth Amendment does not protect, uh, you know, you from snooping on me and from me from snooping on you, right? It does not protect 
us against big, scary Silicon Valley companies. It doesn't protect us from, you know, Uber, which is, you know, down the street, right? Uh, it doesn't, it, does, it only protects the citizen the, 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 against the big, scary capital G government, right? Um, it, and it doesn't protect us against all things that the government does. If you, again, if you remember, if you read the Fourth Amendment, it talks about unreasonable searches and seizures. That's not all searches, that's not all seizures, that's just unreasonable ones. What is a reasonable search? A reasonable search can come in a lot of forms. A reasonable search, most commonly, uh, is something that, is, uh, that we refer to as a warrant, right? So if the police want to search my house, because they think I'm dealing drugs, uh, a, an Oakland police officer, I live in Oakland, an uh, Oakland police officer would say, hey, we think Sarus is dealing drugs. Here, judge, is an affidavit for the reasons explaining why we think he's dealing drugs. Um, please authorize this search of his house. And the judge says, yep, that sounds legit, go ahead, do that. And then they search my house, right? That's a reasonable search, right? A, a, a neutral magistrate in the, in the legal language has authorized the places to be searched and the things or places to be seized, right? They can't just say, go search all, this, all the houses on Sirius's block. They have to say, you know, go look for drugs in his house. Uh, here's why we think that they're there, right? Our four, uh, the, the, the framers of the Constitution were very concerned about something called a general warrant, right? The idea that like, they could kick in anyone's door, overturn anyone's you know, shipping container, not shipping container, you know, like those, those giant you know, steam trunks or whatever, right? Uh, right? They're just like opening stuff, breaking locks, busting down doors, ripping into people's uh, homes, tearing up stuff, and just you know, causing all kinds of chaos, right? And that's terrifying, right? That's, that's like literally the definition of a police state, when the police have essentially unchecked power uh, over, over us and over our physical space, over our private space, over our homes and our, and our bedrooms, right? So this is why we have this little, this little thing uh, that attempts in, to, to check the government's power uh, using this little thing that we call warrants. Okay. There's another, there's another thing that... Uh, that exists that, that, is a, that, is a, that is sort of a, not an exception, but another kind of way around this, this Fourth Amendment idea, which is that if the police come to me, if they come to my door, they knock on my door and they say, hey, can we search your house? We think there's, you know, 10 kilos of cocaine in your, in your house. And I say, yeah, sure, come on in. I have consented to the search. I've said it's okay. In that case, the police can search my house. That is a reasonable search. Okay, um, so that brings us to what we're talking about tonight, which is one of the weirdo exceptions to the Fourth Amendment, which is often referred to as the border exception. If you've traveled in or outside of the United States, you may have experienced this. You may have experienced that the uh, Customs and Border officials uh, can search your car, search your bag, uh, maybe if you're a little less lucky, search your phone uh, or your other, other device. And the government claims that it has the ability to do this because it is exercising its, its sovereign authority over the, the physical borders of the United States. And this is not, you know, inherently wrong. Uh, I think the government has uh, certainly an interest in protecting the borders of the United States. We don't want, you know, bad stuff. We don't want drugs or weapons or, or all kinds of other things coming into the U.S. That makes sense. Um, but. Uh, the government says that because it has this authority to search things that are coming into the country, it has this extraordinary power to do this, to conduct these kinds of searches without a warrant. Uh, so if you turn up at you know, the border between Canada and the U.S. and you're coming back to the U.S. and they say, sir, can I, can I search your car? Can, I, can you open your trunk? Even if you say no, they might still search you anyway, right? They might still search your bag anyway. They might detain you for a couple hours while they do that. Um, so now that we live in a world where uh, a lot, of, where, where when we're traveling abroad, I think most of us are not just carrying, you know, backpacks and purses and, and suitcases. We're also carrying, you know, little machines that carry vast amounts of data, very personal data in many cases, right? Maybe thousands, tens of thousands of, of financial records, photographs, audio recordings, video recordings, uh, web history, email, like almost anything, right? Our lives are very much tied up in this tiny piece of glass and metal that we carry around with us. Um, so the government claims that searching your device, your phone, is just like searching your backpack or your, or your suitcase. 
Um, and so we're now at a moment in American kind of legal history where it's not totally clear whether that is correct. Uh, and so I wanted to kind of give you a, a few kind of interesting examples of cases that I'm reporting on now, uh, or have been reporting on recently and are continuing to report on now, uh, that have to do with these types of searches. And I should say, if you're interested in more kind of in the legal, you know, arcanery, the nerdery of, of all of this, go, go read my book. Uh, it covers 50 years, this is not just a plug for me, but it's, I, I think it's, it's good. Uh, it covers 50 years of, of surveillance law in America from 1967 to 2017. Uh, and I cover 10 mostly Supreme Court cases that explain how it is and why it is that we've ended up with the system that we have today. Uh, this phrase uh, that maybe you've heard, the reasonable expectation of privacy, um, raise your hand if you've heard that phrase. Okay, so chapter one explains like where that phrase comes from and what the legal case is behind it. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, so that's what my, my book is about. So when we, if we come back to the border, one of the things that's really odd about where is to think about not only what is the border, but where is the border, right? I don't know if you guys know this, but, but uh, the federal government claims a 100-mile exclusion zone from the border into the interior of the country as being the border for the purposes of searches. So that means where we're sitting and standing right here right now. That, that the government could claim, because we're within 100 miles of the nearest nautical border, and also the airport is a border, Mo many, most international airports are considered borders, um, I guess all of them. Um, but so conceivably, right, some, some, some federal agent, some border agent could come and, and seize my, you know, my laptop is in my bag over there, could come seize my stuff and could take it under the guise of this border exception. Uh, I don't know of, of many instances where that's happened. The interior of the country usually happens at airports or, or land crossings, uh, but nonetheless, it, it is out there. Uh, and if you think about kind of what that means, you know, if you can imagine a map of the US, 100 miles into the interior of the country is, that covers quite a lot of the country. It covers, I, I'm pretty sure, a majority of the, of the populated areas. Um, so that's, that's one thing that's, that's, that's pretty interesting. Uh, there's another kind of related instance where the government is allowed to cross onto private property up to 25 miles from the border for the purposes of apprehending illegal aliens and preventing uh, illegal entry into the United States. So I mentioned uh, I work for NBC News. Um, prior to that, I worked for, uh, after I left Germany, after being there for two years, I worked for a tech news website called Ars Technica, where I worked for almost seven years. Uh, and a couple of these cases that I'm going to tell you about, I reported on for Ars Technica. So you can go look up my name and some of them later on if you want more details. But one of the cases I wrote about uh, about 18 months ago was a case in Texas uh, about a rancher and attorney named Ricardo Palacios. Uh, Ricardo Palacios uh, was a 70-something-year-old uh, uh, man who had a ranch near Ensenal, Texas. Uh, he lived about 35 miles from the U.S.-Mexico border. And he was uh, walking around his ranch one day, and he discovered, tacked up eight feet high on a mesquite tree, a camera that appeared to uh, be transmitting some kind of information, some sort of video information. It had uh, a lens of some kind. It, ha it appeared to have some sort of antenna. He didn't know what it was. It didn't have any markings. Um, he, he wasn't sure who put it there or why. Uh, he took it down, and he took it back to his house. Very quickly, he got contacted by Customs and Border Patrol, who said, hey, we want our camera back. And he was like, well, I didn't know it was your camera. <laughs> um, and, and eventually, they had this whole back and forth. Uh, and he said, and he eventually filed a lawsuit against Customs and Border Patrol uh, in which he said, look, you, you have exceeded my ranches 35 miles beyond the border. Uh, you claim that you, can, that you can put stuff or cross people's private property up to 25 miles. Um, and, you know, you've put this camera there. And so I'm going to sue you for trespass, basically, uh, onto my land. Eventually, the case went back and forth for a while. Uh, they eventually settled. The government got its camera back. Um, this, is, this camera was believed to be part of a much larger operation that's known as Operation Drawbridge, which is, you can go look this up later. Uh, this is a measure um, where Texas authorities and federal law enforcement are trying to partner with people. And this all predates, like, Trump, by the way, um, where they're trying to encourage, you know, more people to have more surveillance devices near the border. Uh, and so they're trying to kind of feed all of these types of devices together 
So Mr. Palacios uh, was very uh, upset about that because they had trespassed onto his land. Um, that case is, you know, is frustrating, and this is one thing that I've come to understand as, a, as somebody who reports on the legal system uh, over the last few years, is that oftentimes the, the law gets, you know, uh, faced with a particular question, right? Is it okay for the government to put a camera on a guy's private property more than 25 miles beyond the border? In this case, we don't have an answer, despite the fact that he filed a lawsuit. As you may know, a lot of lawsuits end up settling, which is basically good for the lawyers, but I think kind of maybe bad for the, those of us who want to know what the answer is, uh, is because the legal question then remains if the, case, if the case does not get fully adjudicated. If the parties just, just settle and the government pays this guy some money, they get their camera back, everybody goes home happy, the legal question is left unresolved. So that's a little bit frustrating. Um, I wanted to also tell you a little bit about another case uh, that I wrote about that happened much more closer to home. This was uh, actually just a little bit before uh, the Palacios case. Uh, this was a, a story that, uh, that I heard about from a local uh, artist and an art instructor who teaches over in Oakland at the California College of the Arts. Uh, his name is Aaron Gach. Um, and um, I wanted to, and, and I, I had a chance to sit down with Aaron and he told me a really interesting story where he had been coming back into the US from Belgium and he was pulled over at San Francisco airport and he had a really interesting exchange with a couple of agents and the agents basically said that they demanded that he unlock his phone. And he said, well, you know, I've read the constitution, I believe in, you know, constitutional rights and I don't want to unlock my phone. And they basically told him, they threatened in his, in, as he told it to me, to quote, be dicks to him if he did not comply with their demands. And he was anxious to get home to his family, and he was anxious to get back to his job, and so he, you know, begrudgingly handed over his phone. The phone disappeared with the agents into another room for about 10 or 15 minutes. He didn't see it. They, eventually they came back, and they gave it back to him. He supposed, I think probably rightly so, that the phone was, once it was unlocked, right, if you guys know, you've, you, you probably wouldn't uh, hopefully, you know, for most people, hand over your unlocked phone to somebody. Uh, most probably it was imaged. Most probably all of the data was copied, copied off of that phone. Uh, anything that he had on that phone probably is now in some uh, CPB you know, vault somewhere or digital vault somewhere. Uh, and it's really interesting because, if, again, and the authority that the government claims in, in taking Aaron's phone was the border exception, that he was crossing into the United States, he was crossing an international border, that there's an exceptional, uh, the government has exceptional power when the border is involved. And so, um, so that's very weird. And he still to this day, I believe, doesn't have a clear explanation as to why he was targeted uh, on that particular day coming back from Belgium uh, back to SFO. Um, you know, when I tried to uh, talk to CPB and other reporters have tried to get straight answers from CPB and trying to figure out what's going on, right? Why are some people being targeted and not others? Why, according to the government's own statistics, is there a rising rate in recent years? Again, this predates Trump. Uh, uh, it's accelerated under Trump, but the rise began before him. Um, why is there this uptick in searches of digital devices? Uh, and here's what CPB will say, which is not very much. And I'm just going to read you a very short uh, statement that they put out in April 2017. So this was, this was not very long after Aaron was stopped at, at San Francisco airport. CPB says, United States Customs and Border Protection announced today, this is April 2017, that in the first six months of fiscal year 2017, CPB searched the electronic devices of 14,993 arriving international travelers, affecting 0.008% of the approximately 189.6 million travelers arriving to the United States. CPB continues to process more than a million travelers arriving to the United States every day. Of the more than 383.2 million arriving international travelers that the CPB processed in fiscal year 2015, 0.002% of such travelers, 8,503, if you're doing the math at home, had their electronic devices searched. In fiscal year 2016, the number of arriving travelers processed by CPB increased to 390.6 million, and the number of travelers whose devices were searched increased to 19,033, 0.005%. Basically, what CPB is saying is like, look, it's rare, it's really rare. It's like 
a really, really, really tiny percentage. So don't worry about it, is basically what they're saying. Um, in 2017, there was more than 30,000 people's uh, devices were searched. In 2018, it was more than 33,000. Why? We don't know. The government won't tell us. Um, we don't know if there's a, a higher threat of, of, of you know, terrorism or if more people like Aaron Gah are coming through the border. I don't know. They won't tell me. They won't tell anybody. Uh, it's very frustrating, honestly, to report on this kind of stuff. Um, I reported on this for Ars Technica. NBC, before I joined NBC, also reported on this. Um, but it's something that is very, that is uh, continuously ongoing uh, in, in our country. Um, Aaron and a number of other plaintiffs who had similar experiences at different borders around the United States banded together uh, and um, filed a lawsuit against CPB, which is ongoing right now. Uh, ongoing in federal court in Massachusetts. Um, they had a really crucial hearing in July. Actually, just today, I set myself a reminder to pull the transcript for that, case, for that hearing, which won't become available until late next month. Um, uh, this case is known as Al-Assad, A-L-A-S-A-A-D, uh, Al-Assad versus McNeenan, if he's still the head of DHS, I think. Uh, used to be called Al-Assad versus Duke, who used to be the head of DHS. Um, so we basically, that, that case involves a number of plaintiffs. Uh, nearly all of them are U.S. citizens, I think, except for one, um, where they basically claim that they were they felt coerced and they felt that um, that their constitutional rights were violated uh, by the United States government when they were arriving into the United States and they were compelled to unlock their devices at the border. Um, one of the things that's different about this case versus other kinds of cases that have come before it that involve digital searches at the border uh, is a little case that happened that I describe in much more detail in my book uh, that's called Riley versus California. Riley versus California um, is a Supreme Court decision from a few years back which basically says that if you are being arrested, the government cannot search your phone without a warrant. Uh, Riley was a guy who uh, was a suspected gang member in San Diego. Uh, the cops pulled him over. It was late one night. They pulled him over. They, they opened his phone. He had a very early, like, pre-Android Samsung smartphone. Uh, if you remember, there was like a brief minute when there was like a bunch of different smartphones uh, in like the pre-Android iPhone days, if you guys remember the, those dark ages. Um, but th this was the, so there was like no, no, like, you know, there was no like fancy, you know, face ID or touch ID or anything like that. There was no encryption of any kind. Um, they got his phone. They just started scrolling through it. They found a bunch of contacts and videos that, that the police, the San Diego police thought uh, implicated him in gang activity. Uh, eventually, the case went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. You cannot search somebody's phone. Uh, the government claimed in that case that searching somebody's phone is just like searching somebody's wallet, right? So if you get pulled over and, this, and the cops pat you down, they said, oh, the cops have the right to, to search your wallet, uh, and um, so therefore the government claimed they can search your phone. And Supreme Court, and famously in the opinion written by Chief Justice John Roberts, um, he said something to the effect of, uh, you know, Shot, dismissing this, this argument, he said, you know, to make that claim is like saying that a ride on horseback is like a flight to the moon. Uh, you know, they're both methods of transportation, but they're obviously radically different from one another. So Riley, this case, Riley versus California, gives us a really interesting landmark and like legal leg to stand on uh, that the plaintiffs in the Al-Assad case, Aaron Gach and his, and his fellow plaintiffs, are really relying on it. If you go read the, the court documents in that case, they say, hey, the Supreme Court has validated our position that cell phones are different, right? And I talked to one of the lawyers in that case um, who talked about that, you know, searching a phone is inherently different than searching a bag, right? It's not that you're just getting a handful of photos and a handful of papers. You're getting location data and thousands of pictures and financial records and correspondence. And you're getting a vast treasure trove of information that is totally different than what, you, than what normally police would get if they opened up your trunk or your briefcase or your purse or whatever at the border. Um, so again, uh, one of the truths that I have learned is that not only is it frustrating when cases settle, but also the wheels of justice, unfortunately, in this country often turn very slowly. Um, so when will we get uh, the answer in the Al-Assad case? Maybe in a few months, maybe longer, maybe it'll be on appeal, I don't know. It, it takes a while, it's, it's very frustrating. Um, uh, so, 
you know, that's, that's, it's, uh, yeah, so that case is ongoing. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be continuing to follow it, as I'm sure will other people. Um, one last case that I wanted to, to leave you guys with is one of my favorites, uh, which I lovingly refer to as the uh, cheese Danish case. Uh, it involves actual cheese Danishes. I don't have any cheese Danishes to show you, but you guys have had cheese Danishes. Um, the cheese Danish case, and I wrote about this for Ars Technica when it came out uh, a couple years ago. The cheese Danish case involves uh, back in 2016 when the LAPD and the FBI started investigating a drug trafficking ring that was tra uh, trafficking drugs between Los Angeles and Toronto. Um, and eventually in that case, uh, the police found they intercepted 10 duffel bags of cocaine, which if you do the math works out to apparently something on the order of 200 kilos of cocaine, which is a lot of cocaine. Um, so they, inter they intercepted all this cocaine that was leaving LA and going towards Canada. And they uh, essentially infiltrated this group. This group was using sort of an encrypted chat. Uh, uh, if you look this up, there was this very shady company that was called Phantom Secure that had these special encrypted Blackberries that they were using. Uh, turns out encryption doesn't work very well if somebody who's using one of these devices is handing over all the text messages to the government. Whatever. OPSEC is hard, is what I'm saying. Um, so, uh, so the government infiltrated this group. They learned that the group was going to be doing dry runs uh, from, from Canada to the US, uh, going the other way. Uh, and they were going to be driving a particular truck, a, a particular you know, giant shipping truck, the, sa the very same truck that had transported the 200 kilos of cocaine just months earlier. So, October 2017, the truck, the government knows uh, because it's a commercial truck and you have to like pre-register when and where you're gonna cross the border, uh, that was gonna be traveling from Ontario, Canada to of all places, Ontario, California, which is just east of Los Angeles. I don't know why you have to do that, but you know, to Ontario's uh, to, to drive cheese danishes. They were driving a freaking truckload of frozen cheese danishes for Starbucks. Uh, honestly, this is, I, I don't know why you couldn't source frozen cheese danishes closer to Ontario, California, but I'm not in the cheese danish business. Um, so this, this FBI agent in LA who's monitoring this truck and knows when it's gonna come into the US, um, rings up her buddies in Homeland Security Investigations in Michigan, in Port Huron, Michigan, uh, at the border, and uh, amongst themselves, they're trying to figure out how they can determine when the truck is gonna cross the border and when it's gonna arrive in LA. So this agent says to, they, they discuss with each other, and they decide uh, on their own somehow that it's legal to place a physical tracking device, a physical GPS tracking device onto the truck uh, as it's entering into the border. Why? Because of our friend, the border exception. Um, so, and they actually end up deciding that they're not gonna place one tracking device, they're actually gonna place two. They're gonna place one under the cab and one under the trailer of the truck that's carrying this truckload of cheese danishes. So when it crosses the border, uh, HSI slaps the trackers on there. Uh, a special Agent Moore in her office in Los Angeles uh, kicks back and watches the little you know, truck beep beeping across her screen as it drives southwest from Michigan to Los Angeles. Uh, eventually, uh, the truck arrives, they pull the truck over, um, the police uh, are looking for evidence of drug trafficking. They don't find drugs, they do find uh, several uh, four pound bags of sugar, like just the same kind of bags of sugar that you get at Safeway or whatever, like, like little sacks of sugar. Uh, the police believe that this was a dry run to simulate the size and weight of cocaine. Uh, they also find a number of, of, of brand new in the package cell phones. The guys in the truck claim that they have no idea whose cell phones they are. Um, and the cheese danishes the police don't care about. Um, so, they, um, so they arrest the guys, they charge them with drug trafficking. Um, the cheese danishes eventually are safely delivered, so no worry about that. Um, uh, and eventually they, they charge them with, with, uh, with federal drug trafficking. The defense in this case argues that the placement of the GPS trackers at the border was a violation of the Constitution. And the government in turn says, hey, border exception, we're good. Uh, and the, the judge in this case in Riverside, California, says no. Says no, you can't place these, these tracking devices uh, on this truck without a, without a warrant. And I'm just gonna read to you a very short part uh, from the judge's ruling. He says this. This is Judge Bernal from Riverside. 
permitting agents to apply GPS trackers to any vehicle at the border and subsequently monitor its location without first obtaining a warrant flies in the face of Jones. That's another Supreme Court case I read about in the book. You should go read my book. This is all a big plug for my book. Which holds that the installation of a GPS device constitutes a search under the Fourth Amendment. The government agents here did not seek legal advice on their decision to install the devices and chose instead to rely on two Homeland Security Investigations agents' understanding of the law. They just did it on their own. They didn't even check with their own agency's lawyers. And the judge is like, nope, you can't do that. Um, so the judge granted the, the defense's motion to suppress evidence, right? This is, this is the remedy, this is like the legal remedy for illegal, for unconstitutional searches, is you suppress evidence, they call this fruits of the poisonous tree, maybe you've heard that phrase, right? So all of the cheese danishes and the sacks of sugar and the weirdo phones and all this stuff, they said, okay, that doesn't count, um, which makes the government's case a lot harder to prosecute. Ultimately, the government dismissed the charges, the truck, uh, I think the danishes stayed, but the truck and everything else went back to Canada, End of story. I only found out about this case because the defense lawyer emailed me, this is why I say tips are welcome, emailed me and said, hey, I had this really interesting case you might want to know about. But here's the weird coda to this story, which is that after this case was over, after the charges were dropped, after the government had been told already by a federal judge that its practices were unconstitutional, Homeland Security came back to court and had a really incredible statement. They said, this is a, a, an assistant director uh, from Homeland Security Investigations. He's a pretty high up official. He writes, Homeland Security Investigations exercises its border search authority for the purpose of protecting national security and revenue of the United States. Pursuant to this authority, it is policy that a customs officer may install a GPS tracking device on a vehicle at the United States border without warrant or individualized suspicion. HSI limits warrantless GPS monitoring to 48 hours, with the exception of airplanes, commercial vehicles, and semi-tractor trailers, which have a significantly reduced expectation of privacy in the location of their vehicles. It is HSI's position that such policy is consistent with the United States Supreme Court's decisions in United States versus Jones and United States versus Flores Montaro. They're basically saying, even though you told us we couldn't do this, we're still going to do it anyway. <laughs> Which is weird, which is very weird. Um, and uh, yeah, so I wrote a second article that basically pointed that out, that there was this kind of extra filing where they were like, hey, even though you told us not to do this anymore, we still think we can do this, uh, so we're gonna keep doing it. Um, some of you guys may be familiar with an organization uh, not, located not very far from here called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which does great advocacy work in this area. Um, they submitted a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request to HSI asking for details about this case. Uh, that request was denied, they appealed, uh, and so now EFF is suing uh, for records about this case to learn more about what the government was thinking and what it was doing, uh, what its legal arguments were, and so on. At the same time, I also filed a FOIA to the FBI asking for records about this particular case, the, the Cheese Danish case. Maybe they'll send me a Cheese Danish. Um, the FBI wrote back to me not long ago, just a couple months ago, and said, we have no records to give you. We're sorry. And I said, bullshit, you don't. And so I appealed, and they said, we really don't have any records to give you. Which is crazy, I think, because their own lawsuit, their own, their own case, their own filings describe in detail the affidavit of an FBI agent that describes what she did. Um, so I'm hoping that I get to, now that I work for, for NBC News, I'm hoping that I'm going to get to sue the FBI pretty soon. That'd be fun. Um, so, um, so, uh, so yeah, so if you know anything about the Cheese Danish case or any other cases like that, I would be, I would be grateful to know. Um, but all that is to say that these issues uh, are very much still live. They're very much still ongoing. The law is very much unsettled. I didn't even get into some of the other kind of craziness uh, that is going on with um, uh, what's often called compelled decryption, uh, right? So if, uh, if you arrive at the border and you, you, know, you have your phone and the officers put your thumbprint on the phone and you know, compelling you to decrypt your phone, or think of it this way, uh, you know, taking your, you know, some, a lot of these phones now, the newer iPhones, I, I have a slightly older iPhone, right, have the like face ID feature, right? So like, imagine if you're at a border checkpoint, the, uh, the agent takes your phone 
and then you're just sitting there waiting for them to like let you go or whatever, and they hold your phone up to you and they say, hey, is this your phone? Boom, it unlocks, right? Like that's not crazy, right? That's how the technology works. Uh, and you wouldn't even have to physically interact with the device to do that. Uh, and because of this magical border exception, I feel like that's not a crazy scenario to, to conceive of. Um, and as of now, the law is on the government side. Um, and it may be a little while, because the legal system is slow, uh, before we get a clear answer from the Supreme Court or from any other court uh, as to whether or not that's okay. Remember, uh, Aaron Gach, his case is just in federal district court in Massachusetts, which is like the lowest level of federal court. There's another appeals court and the Supreme Court after that, if it even gets that far. And even if it does, it would take years to do that. So what I'm saying is, is that like, and this is kind of one of the themes in my book, which is that you know the technology uh, gets really good really fast, as I think most of us know, uh, the law, is very slow by comparison. Um, so it's very difficult to kind of know how these things are, are, are exactly gonna play out. Um, so I think I'm gonna stop there, uh, and I appreciate your attention and your interest, and I'm happy to take as many questions as you'll, as you'll allow me. So thank you. Um, thank you, Sarus, that was fascinating and terrifying. Thank you. <laughs> and um, let's all help him sue the FBI. So if you have tips, please send. Um, I will take questions. So anyone who has a question? Oh, there are a lot. I'll start in the back and move my way forward. So you had given us information about an increase in the number of searches of electronic devices. Yes. Do you have similar data for how many, whether there's been a similar increase in imaging of devices That's at the border? That's a great question. And ultimately, what's the ultimate disposition of that data once they get it from you? Uh, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Do you know the answer, Mike? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know the answer, but I think that's a great question and that, you know, the, the wheels are turning and I'm thinking maybe I should, that's, a, that's something that I should uh, uh, maybe file another FOIA of because, yeah, um, as you mentioned, um, right, so those are just the searches. Um, the government refers to um, uh, forensic searches where they're like actually imaging and keeping that data, how long they're keeping it, who has access to it, under what circumstances. Uh, I don't think there's a clear, as far as I know, maybe other people know, uh, I don't know that there's a clear answer as to under what circumstances that data is kept or accessed or, or what. Um, but I think that's a really, really great point. Thank you for, for bringing that to my attention. Um, so you mentioned this idea of uh, compelled decryption. Yeah. So in your statement, you talked about like um, using the existing functionality, like the phone sure. seeing you or your uh, uh -huh. thumbprint. Um, I learned recently that Android has a lockdown mode where you can actually force it to uh, disable that and require you to put in you know, a password. Right. Um, do, are you aware of the case law or situations regarding, you know, Let's say you're being questioned and you suddenly quickly put it into lockdown. Yeah, like so what, what yeah, I think I heard somebody's case. klaxon on somebody's phone going off. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think I think phones have a, I think all Android and, and iOS phones have like a feature where I, on, on iOS, I think it's like if you hit the button five times or something, then it will disable the like fingerprint feature and I assume Android has something similar. Um, I think that's a really interesting uh, safety feature, but I think what that, the scenario that that feature is designed with is like you're in a protest or something and you have access to your device, right? Your device is in your pockets, in your hand or whatever. And you can like, or you think you're about to be arrested or, like, or something like that. Um, uh, so that, I think that's what that's designed for. I don't think that it's designed for crossing a border where somebody else conceivably has your device, right? Um, if you're very worried about, right, and you'll hear this from a lot of security experts, if you're really worried about uh, CPB or whatever, whether you're crossing into the US or into China or to wherever, and you're worried about some, some foreign border agent gaining access to your device, either don't take it with you, like don't, just don't travel with the device, or Travel with something that's like super clean. Like take your device, buy a new device, you know, like um, you know, format it. Like like put nothing on it that is important, um, uh, except you know your favorite podcast or whatever, I guess. But like you know, like something immaterial. Um, uh, so that's that's one way one way to do it. So. Um, 
But it's, it's a hard problem. And I think, you know, there are many people in, in the Bay Area who are politically minded and who might have sensitive materials. I've heard this from, from attorneys, right, that for this exact reason, and, and this is like another kind of legal rabbit hole that I'm not going to get into right now, but like there's this whole debate about whether or not you can be compelled to give up your password or your passcode, like the strings of numbers and letters, versus your fingerprint to unlock the device. Uh, and I've heard from some attorneys that say, for this reason, I don't use the fingerprint feature because hopefully the Fifth Amendment, we talked about amendments one, two, three, and four, the Fifth Amendment, right, uh, you have the right to remain silent. You have the right to not testify against yourself. Um, the idea that your passcode would be testimonial uh, is what protects you, hopefully, there. Whereas a physical, you know, biometric, uh, your fingerprints, your eye print, your face print, would not protect you in the same way. But again, the law is not totally resolved on that question. You don't have to provide your past code, no. But again, the border makes everything weird, right? Like if the, poli if the San Francisco police pull you over tonight and, uh, and say, hey, unlock your phone, you say, I'm not going to, then, I would say you're, you're probably in a better situation than if the CPB at SFO, you know, takes your phone from you and, you know, you never see it again, <laughs> is my guess. Uh, question up here, I guess? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> thank, th thank you for what you do, sir. Is, thank you. Um, you said, and maybe this was just oversimplification, that... Um, there isn't a lot of use of the border exception to surveil domestic travelers. And I think that's a widespread belief. A lot of people feel like they're not vulnerable if they're not traveling internationally. But there are a couple of major um, circumstances where the government is actively using the border exception to surveil purely domestic travelers, mainly to try to intercept drugs deliberately using the fact that something is near the border. Two places where I know that's happening and where there's been a fair amount of exposure. One is that there's systematic boarding of east-west Amtrak trains at a couple points where the east-west routes get within 100 more miles of both the Canadian and Mexican borders every night. A team of CBP people with DEA and local police go on to each major east-west Amtrak train and go through it, targeting people based on the Amtrak passenger manifests who they think will be uh, drug couriers. Um, there's been some FOIA cases uh, related to that um, brought by the ACLU and other immigrant rights groups, uh, both in New York uh, and in uh, New Mexico. The other situation, um, which is a case I think you might want to actually write about, um, is that there are permanent border checkpoints on east-west roads that don't intersect the border, like the one on I-5 that goes down to, you know, between San Diego and Tijuana, but on roads that don't intersect the border. Um, there's a guy named Terry Bressy, who's an engineer uh, with the University of Arizona in uh, Tucson, who works at Kitt Peak at the observatory. Every time he goes to work, he has to go through one of these border, uh, border, border checkpoints. He's been involved in litigation. He's been successful in some of it, but he's still got a case going, trying to get a definitive ruling that they can't use that. Um, Terry Bressy is his name, and I think that's, it's a very interesting precedent about whether they can conduct that kind of surveillance where the goal is uh, interdicting domestic drugs and has nothing to do with the border, but they're just putting some CBP people there and putting it within 100 miles of the border as their, their legal pretext. Yeah. I, think, I think those are all fair points, and I appreciate your, your reminding me of those. That's, that's really good. Uh, do you know about the case, I think it was this week, where a person in the L.A. area went to the airport to, to claim some incoming shipments to pay the customs, and they harassed the hell out of him. Uh, he was not crossing the border or in any way. I, I did hear about this. There was a piece on The Intercept, I, I believe, today. Yes. Yeah. I think, was it L.A. or New York State? I, I thought no, it was, it was maybe... L.A. It was oh, somewhere okay. in the oh. West. I think it was the West Coast. Yeah. Um, yeah, the border, I mean, I think that's one of the things that I find continuously weird as somebody who's very fascinated by borders of all kinds, is that the border is not, at least in this country, is not always where we think it is or should be. Um, and can affect people in sometimes uh, unforeseen ways. There's a question behind you. Speaking of oh. borders, does that does the border also include the border between us and like Indian reservations? Because technically, they're sovereign. 
That's a great question. Um, does the border count between the U.S. And, and Indian reservations? I'm not sure, but I'm not a lawyer, but I'm not sure. I don't know of any cases off the top of my head where that has been an issue, but that's a, I think that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, embassies are also weird. Um, yeah, if you throw your iPhone into the Russian embassy, will they yell at you? Uh, probably. Um, yeah. Uh. Hey, thanks for the talk. That was awesome. Thank you. Uh, so my question is about, so I, I like to make music videos kind of in, about this topic. And I'd love to know, I think obviously a lot of people here are probably somewhat interested in this topic. So I'd love I think to this talk would go great under like an EDM beat, I think, <laughs> maybe. And my question is, I think, you know, it can get very technical and it can get very sort of ab abstract for a lot of people. And people will say, you know, like, okay, if I'm doing nothing wrong, I have nothing to hide. How do you, like, what have you found resonates with a lot of people to get them interested in this type of topic? And like, you know, how do you, how do you make this relatable for people? I think that's a great question. And it's, to be honest, it's a struggle. It's really a struggle. Um, I, think, I think most people would say, I lead a very boring life. I pay my taxes. I go to work. I hang out with my kids, whatever it is, right, that we all do in our regular lives. Um, the thing that I always say to people about privacy in general is we all have things that we want to keep private. We all have locks on our doors. We all have passcodes on our phones. We all have, uh, you know, uh, things that we keep uh, in our homes, be they you know, substances like marijuana, be they sex toys, be they religious artifacts of some kind, be they personal documents, the things that are maybe only meaningful to you, right, that, that you don't want other people to see. Um, we all have, or I think seek, uh, privacy of some type or another, and that's different for different people at, for different purposes. Um, so if somebody says to me, oh, I, I have nothing to hide, I always say to them, okay, uh, can I have a key to your house and the password to your email? And nobody's ever given them to me. <laughs> um, so uh, you know who you fear, right? In in the in this kind of world, right? Right? We talk about um, th you've probably heard this phrase threat modeling, right? That just that's a fancy way of saying who are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Are you afraid of the Oakland Police Department? Are you afraid of Customs and Border? Are you afraid of the NSA? Are you afraid of the boogeyman, Google, right? whatever, like whatever it is? Um, and depending on who you think your adversary is may depend and may determine what actions you take or don't take. Um, if you're afraid that, that you're, go you're entering China and you don't want some Chinese border agent to search your phone, you decide, okay, I'm not gonna take my phone with me. Or I'm gonna take a clean phone or whatever. Um, and so once you start kind of running this kind of math in your head as to like, you know, I'm gonna take this action but not this other action, um, I think we all kind of in our own way think, okay, I'm, I am gonna take this extra step to mitigate this threat, but I'm not really, I'm not really worried th about the SFMTA knowing that I have a clipper card and that I got off at, at, at you know, Powell Station or whatever, right? Um, but maybe you are because you're going to meet, you know, your, if you're a journalist, you're gonna meet some, you know, you're gonna meet Deep Throat or whatever. Um, uh, or you're coming to this event and you don't want, you know, your employer to know, or who knows, right? Um, but you're right. I think it's hard for people to kind of get around abstract th threats and abstract concerns. And I think that, I hope that, you know, talks like mine and art installations like or down below can help, you know, make these this kind of reality much more concrete for people to be like, yeah, like, your face is in this database. Your license plate is, has already been captured by your city police department. Um, and, you know, uh, you know the, the, somebody was telling me earlier, there was the, there was the thing downstairs about um, scanning the, the barcode or whatever code is on the back of your driver's license. Um, somebody was saying how like they had been blacklisted uh, at a couple of bars because like they were doing a test and like the, the, they set up like a fake blacklist, but then it didn't get lifted in time, so she like couldn't go to like a couple of bars that she wanted to go to, even though she like legitimately should have been, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, that's a very tiny example, you know. But but you're right. I think it's I think it's really hard, um, and we live in a world where you know data breaches happen all the time, and um, you know, but but it's we can't. 
it, you know, I often say, like, it's really easy to live a totally private life. You just, you know, throw all your devices in the bay and move to the Sierras and never communicate with anybody ever again, which I think would work, but it's also very boring because we like human interaction and we like cat videos and we like fun things on the internet, you know? So, like, it's hard, you know? It's really hard. What do you think you can offer to people? I think a lot of times it's people value convenience, for example. For sure. And, you know, totally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Totally. Same thing with the facial scanner. Yeah. What do you think, like, the average, the average person that does value convenience? Yeah. Value them, right? Yeah. What do you think people would sort of value? Like, what can you give them so that they're like, like, okay, I don't want to shop at an Amazon go to the market there. I don't want to, like, you know what I mean? Like, what is an alternative, sort of an alternative? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a great question. I think showing, making the, there was something, I, I, think, I think maybe you were telling me earlier that there's part of the exhibit, and I haven't seen all the exhibits here down below, but, but there was a thing about like how much your time and labor converts into, or how much your data converts into time and labor. So saying like, right, like the fact that all of these companies that we all use, whether it's Amazon or Google or Uber or whatever else, right, we are paying through our own data and our own usage. So I think saying to people like, you know, yeah, you're you've you're you're telling Safeway that you like whatever type of Cheerios in exchange for seventy five percent. So a lot of this technology is actually making it cheaper for us. So if you yeah. go to those stores, they don't have to hire people you're gonna get cheaper things. Maybe. So yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's it's a hard question. I think there was one more question on this side. Yeah, but you're but right, I don't know that there's a clear answer, I think is I'm, I'm going to take your question one okay. second after I plug oh. our data detox there kit, which is downstairs. Um, if you do want to um, know what you can do and you do want to use alternative apps or alternative browsers or you want tips on how to protect your privacy, you can go downstairs and visit our data detox bar and pick up the data detox kit. And now I will take your question. <laughs> Um, great. Yeah. So um, my question relates to in May. Um, I know headline was Trump administration says now if you're applying for a work visa, you need to submit five year social media history. Mm -hmm. I'm on a work visa. So I noticed that. Um, and so my question is twofold. Like, do you have any new kind of nuanced analysis of what that actually means? And then secondly, um, would you see this type of kind of discriminatory treatment on borders because of the stuff you put online being incorporated into their judgments. So, yeah, thanks. Um, do I have any nuanced uh, analysis of that? No, I don't. I would be, uh, to be honest, I would love to, I've heard some of the same news reports that you, you've heard, but I have yet to hear, and this may just be my own ignorance, I have yet to hear like what that looks like in practice. Um, so if you or someone you know has an experience about that, I would love to hear about it. Um, um, but I think, you know, now that we, I mean, many of us live very public lives online that are, that overlap or maybe sometimes the same as our offline lives and maybe they impact us in ways that we don't imagine. Um, I know for myself, um, you know, as somebody who, right, you, if you go look me up online, you'll see I have a very, I'm too active on Twitter. Uh, I don't have Twitter on my phone for this reason because I use it too much, uh, so I only use it on my laptop. Um, but I have started to think about the ways in which I use some of these technologies because they can be used against you in ways that you didn't anticipate, whether that's the US government wanting to know what you tweeted about five years ago or whatever, but also things like um, my colleague at NBC News, uh, Olivia Solon, did a great story about um, uh, Flickr, a com IBM basically packaging a massive data set of pictures on Flickr and then using them for the purposes of facial recognition. I had Flickr images going back almost 15 years. Um, and I pulled down my entire Flickr account for that reason because I didn't want, I mean, it was too late by that point, my, my you know, pictures of me, of my wife, of my brother, of my grandfather um, that were captured uh, and sucked up into this, into this facial recognition you know, data set. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's related to that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, all that is to say, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky. It's hard. And the answer may be, right, and, and this is something that First Amendment scholars have talked about for a long time, is that it creates a chilling effect, right? It creates, it means you might decide, like I did, to, to pull your account down or to not use the account or to not sign up for the service or to not, to not go to the protest or to not do the thing that you otherwise would have done because you fear the repercussions that might come with it. Uh, not you personally, but like, you know. 
Can I ask where you're from? Canada, Canada I've heard of it, okay. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very tricky. Um, um, yeah, I would be interested to know, and we can talk about this more, you know, separately, uh, how, like, American data and, like, border digital searches are different. Like, if, if you, as, as a Canadian coming to the U.S., if you have a different experience generally than coming back to Canada. But anyway. Um, we have to wrap it up there, but I want to right. thank Ruth for his talk. And I'm sure he's willing to stick around to answer questions.